music has been around since the dawn of man. It's in our genes and hardwired in our brains. Actually, there's no other human activity that can activate the whole brain the way music does. The whole brain, all parts of the brain are in action when the, when the brain makes music out of simple vibrations in the air. So, have a look <coughs> at this video. Bah, when you focus bah, on the right, bah, left side of the screen, bah, you'll see Christy say ba, ba, ba. But when you turn your bah, attention to the bah, right side of the screen, bah, you see va, va, va. But bah, still, bah, you only hear ba. The sound hasn't bah, changed. Bah, bah. The reason we hear Va, when we look at the right side of the screen, is that the lips there form fa. So seeing fa and hearing ba makes you perceive something in the middle, va. <laughs> so what you see affects what you hear. It's called the McGurk effect. A tone is not a tone, it's actually a string of tones on top of the basic uh, fundamental. You can hear them now. Yet, we only hear a single tone. So the brain simplifies the words for us. It um, makes all this into one single tone by fusion. And fascinatingly, if you play a chord of sinus tones that represent the third, fourth, and fifth overtones of a given fundamental frequency, as shown in this slide, your brain will still uh, see this as the fundamental. So you hear the missing fundamental, a tone that's actually not there. So the tone you hear now is actually only a construction in your mind. It's not there in the real world, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, a little bit annoying, perhaps. <clears throat> so what we perceive is the brain's interpretation of the world. What the brain sees as the most likely explanation, given the information it's got. Evolution developed the brain to be a hypothesis machine. So we could predict the future to decide uh, what's the best next move, to avoid danger, find food. So the brain will create a hypothesis of um, what the world is like and use incoming information from the senses continually to update the picture. It's much faster to update a small error of calculation than to redraw the whole picture again and again. So when you listen to music, your brain will automatically create expectations about what's coming next. So if you listen to music that's familiar to you, your brain will be able to make good guesses of what's coming next. You will be able to perceive all the details and the music will be interesting to listening to. When you listen to an unfamiliar music on the other hand, say you usually only listen to Mozart and know you're going to try with the Tupac or the Scorpions, then your brain will make very bad guesses about what's coming next and you'll miss all the details and the music will seem boring, dull, humdrum. Actually, this is the way our brain makes sense of the world, not only music. So the brain simplifies the world for us. It makes us see things maybe in more contrast and clearer, but still, it's only an assumption. And since it's based on previous experiences, we tend to judge the unknown quickly and unfortunately not always fairly. 
We may think of ourselves as rational creatures, that we make our decisions based on logic and reason, while in fact, it's the gut feeling that decides. We depend on our emotional system to make the right decisions. In all mammals, sounds on the auditory system have direct access to um, the emotional parts of the brain. That's why music can manipulate the feelings and induce any kind of emotional state, state in your mind and body. And when you listen to rewarding, no, to your favorite music, you will stimulate the reward systems of the brain. Much the same way your favorite food will, the sex can, and also some recreational drugs like cocaine. So this was common knowledge back in the 60s, I guess. <laughs> Still, I think it's the way music can, can activate the whole brain, including the reward system, that is the key to music's ability to change the brain. So Hippocrates uh, described the healing powers of music 2,500 years ago. He wrote about how you could use music to learn people that have been in bed for months after fractures to learn how to walk again. Today, we use music to ease all movements in patients with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's patients have problems initiating movements, as you see. But just as most of us will automatically start to nod our heads or cramp along with rhythmic music, Parkinson's patients can also adhere to the rhythm and move with the pulse of the music. Yeah. So we have patients that can barely walk, but when you put on the music, they dance along on high heels. So it may seem like magic, but uh, all movements are in nature rhythmical. They are based on highly coordinated and finely tamed muscle contractions. So Parkinson patients can adhere to the rhythm of the music and move nearly as normal. The goal of the therapy is for the patients to try to achieve the same results by creating music in their minds. Music can also be of benefit for patients who have had traumatic head injuries. Berit Wieck, a piano teacher, had personally experienced that practicing the piano could help her regain function after a head injury. So she uh, wanted to try this out more systematically and approached me. And our simple idea was to teach patients with problems after head injuries to, uh, to play the piano. Playing the piano is uh, highly multimodal. Uh, it requires, it re requires reading the music, transforming the notes into finger movements, and coordinate both hands. You need to monitor the results of your efforts, the sounds you produce. So you use your visual brain, your reading areas, your planning areas, your motor areas, your sensory areas, your hearing areas, in effect, the whole brain. And the practice is both rewarding and repetitive. In effect, building new networks in the brain. Patients with uh, traumatic head injuries often have problems with cognition, headaches, fatigue, memory trouble, and often struggle to get back to their normal life. But after eight weeks of training with the piano, we could see that their frontal lobes normalized. In yellow here, you see a key area for planning ahead, memory, taking the right decisions, was reactivated. 
after eight weeks of piano training. And you could see that the memory improved, the red line here. The memory got back almost to normal levels. And they were able to take part in social situations. Six out of seven were even able to go back to work or school. So in effect, they got our life back. Interestingly, we also found uh, that the piano playing normal healthy controls also changed their brain by the training. As you can see for the, from the green line here, they also improved their memory. And we could see uh, changes in motor systems in their brain. And this is after eight weeks only. So the musician's brain is a gift to the neuroscientist. But studying the brains of people that have spent thousands of hours with their instruments have also shown us that music can actually be a gift to the brain. The musician's auditory system, seen in yellow here, is finely tuned for any task, language as well as music. The connecting bridge between the two hemispheres is stronger and bigger, seen in orange here, and hand coordination is better. The hand areas of the brain are bigger and fine motor skills improved. Musically trained children and young adults usually do better at uh, school, they score better at IQ tests and memory tests, and it's even shown that Music making can protect the brain from dementia and slow down brain aging. So my philosophy is simple. Do something good to your brain and your brain will be good to you. And I guess many of you will have your first piano in your pocket or at a tablet at home. You can even create an instrument of your own design. So just play. Your brain will love you for it. Thank you.